Today, my assignment is to talk about the Book of Common Prayer, otherwise known as what? What else do we call it? Can't hear you. What? Yeah, the BCP, or the prayer book, right? We call it the prayer book, for short. A little more informal. So, uh, so uh, last, this past Monday, uh, John Stone Street got a gift in the mail of a leather-bound 1928 Book of Common Prayer, and this note was with it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> dear John, it's a Dear John letter. When you told me, what is that doing? Who's, who's adept at this stuff? I'm going to mess this up. Oh, the, the Wi-Fi went off. Yeah. Well, let me press. It, here's, here's what was written. When you told me how much you enjoy the Anglican form of worship, including the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, my heart leaped for joy. Decades ago when I was in the hospital, most of the scripture I knew was woven throughout that little prayer book, and often I would bounce from the general thanksgiving to the general confession and other prayers just to assure my heart, just to calm my troubled soul. It was familiar and it was biblical. Even the chants from the morning and evening liturgy of prayer were soothing as I'd sing them to myself when no one else was awake in our six bed ward. So I knew I had to send you a little gift just to encourage you on as you and your family delight in worshiping using this ancient book of prayer. To this day, I can still feel the heavy hands of Bishop Higgins from the Reformed Episcopal Ch Seminary on my head as I was confirmed. It was a serious thing to become a member of such an historic church, and to this day, I'm grateful for the solemnity of the occasion. I pray your church will enjoy a lively impact on your community and that its influence will be salt and light there in Colorado Springs. Many blessings signed Johnny Erickson Tata. Everybody know who everybody know who Johnny is? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Robert, you want to give a, a brief bio? So isn't that wonderful? The fact that the Lord touched her through uh, her association with the Anglican Communion and her experience of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer and how that ministered to her in profound ways where she, she understood the solemnity, uh, the, the sort of awesome, in the right sense of the word, respect that we have towards Almighty God and our worship uh, the reference and so forth. But what a huge blessing to have that connection between her, John Stone Street, and our own congregation. 
and it makes for the perfect introduction to talk about our Book of Common Prayer. Uh, I don't think she's continued in her in Anglicanism, but obviously it's stuck with her. Which, which, when you think about it, isn't, isn't that interesting? So many years, she was she had her injury, diving injury, that left her a quadriplegic in, when she was 18, and she's now 60. Eight years old. She's 68 now. Yeah, amazing. So, um, I would love to read this entire preface to you, especially because it's fun to see the words from back then, the way the English was spelled. But Thomas Cranmer wrote this preface to the first Book of Common Prayer in 1549. You know, it's it's about this long, and. Uh, I meant to have a, a, a copy printed off for you. Maybe I could get that for you another time. Or you can just look it up. Um, there was never anything by the wit of man so well devised or so surely established, which in the continuance of time hath not been corrupted. I mean, what application could you make of that today uh, in just about every sphere of life? As, and these are not misspellings, as, among other things, it may plainly appear by the common prayers in the church, commonly called divine service, the first original and grounds whereof, if a man would search out by the ancient fathers, he shall find that the same was not ordained, but of a good purpose, and for a great advancement of godliness." And if you were to continue to read through, we just don't have the time for me to do it, you would hear in his preface the primary reasons for why he took on the task of reforming the worship of the church within the context of the 16th century Reformation, right? And all the influences that were coming from uh, the European continent. Well, at the time of the 16th century Reformation, clergy were using a number of different sources to plan the various worship services and liturgies of the church. For example, they were using the Roman Missal, <clears throat> which is the Mass, or like the book we have up on our altar, the Breviary, which contained the daily offices, the Manual, which contained the occasional services like baptism, confirmation, burial, and so forth, the Pontifical, which was the ordination services, Book of Psalms, the gradual and antiphoner, which went with uh, Holy Communion and the daily offices respect, uh, respectively. Those were the chant, books used to plan chant. And there were a number of other books, you, those used to plan processions, all kinds of elaborate processions. There was a lot of, uh, um, I call it silliness. There was, <laughs> All the, all the reasons for the Reformation, you know, were, were embodied within sort of the corruption of superstition embedded in all these other books that were used by the clergy, and it was all in Latin in the West. So Archbishop Cranmer, the first Archbishop of Canterbury, appointed by King Henry as Archbishop King Henry VIII in 1532, under the influences of the Continental Reformation and some of those key personalities, Cranmer set to crafting a comprehensive and condensed compilation of liturgies that could be published in one volume. So, you like all the, what do you call that, onomatopoeia? Can you do that? Crafting a comprehensive and condensed compilation of liturgies that could be published in one, in a, in a single volume. Right there, 1928, okay. Come down to us today. <coughs> Excuse me. Not only, not only did he condense all that, all the critical pieces and parts, and leave out all the superstition and, and peripheral stuff that didn't need to be there, um, that was bad doctrine and wrongly forming the people of the church, membership of the church, he also translated uh, his volume into English, into the mother tongue of the people that could be then held in the hands of the laity of the church and read in the English language. 
The original was published, like I said, in 1549. Let me get on here. I'm not teaching often enough, so I'm, not, I'm out of sync. I never should have said that. <laughs> never should have said that. <laughs> That's going to come back at me. Yeah. The original was pu published in 1549 and went through several, a number of editions, um, updates, changes, because of the different uh, theological winds, reforming winds of the times, and uh, storms, you might say. Uh, until it settled in the form of the 1662, and I'll say English, because you have to start distinguishing eventually between the English prayer books and those that were then uh, uh, put together in different provinces of the church, like the American province here. We have our own American prayer books, which would be, when I say 28, that's what I mean. So 1662, uh, published by King Charles II upon the restoration of the monarchy following the English Civil War in what was called the interregnum period between poor Charles I, who lost his head, and, uh, and then King Charles II. Today, Anglican clergy are, in, and I should have grabbed all three here, entrusted with three primary sources to plan the worship of the church. Uh, and not only primary sources, but authorized, three primary authorized sources. And when I say three, I don't mean one, three separate books or three distinct books. One resource could be several or a number of books, like the prayer book. We might, in planning worship, consult more than the 1928 prayer book. We might look at the 1662. Or we might look at the 1979, don't everybody gasp. <clears throat> but the three are Holy Scripture, of course, the Book of Common Prayer, and one that I'm going to start pushing within the jurisdiction of the Armed Forces and Chaplaincy because the church has lost this as an authorized book for worship, and that is what? The hymnal. <laughs> One of the breakdowns in the church is that we think we can sing anything we want. That if the Spirit moves Joe Schmo, you know, on Saturday to write a song, that he can just bring that and sing it in church the next Sunday without it being authorized, without it being theologically screened by the clergy. Does that make sense? And so. And that's a means of forming the people of God. And so when you let that stuff into the church, thank you for the emphasis. Exactly. That's right. Then we start confusing people theologically, potentially. Okay. Uh, okay. Forgive me one second, I've got my notes out of order. <clears throat> okay, so that's a good segue then to, um, did I talk about why the prayer book is so, how did these get, somebody came in and changed my notes. <laughs> which, I, which I always, which I always number my pages before I get here. But here's my excuse. I got rear-ended Wednesday morning and got some minor whiplash, so that's my excuse. <laughs> I'm just fine. If the car's not. It wasn't my truck. Um, okay, so why is the Book of Common Prayer... Well, I want to talk about this. So prayer, by prayer, we talk about... Um, the, the title, the Book of Common Prayer. So I talked about the book. Prayer uh, here means in the more comprehensive sense of worship. And so our common service of worship, which includes the more narrow definition of prayer as asking, requesting, and treating. But it's more than that, the Book of Common Prayer. Um, and common prayer is called such because it directs 
the common or corporate prayer of the church. So it doesn't mean common as in unimportant or ins insignificant. It's uh, rather uh, this idea of community or corporate, uh, communal, of the communion. That worship, that prayer which belongs to the whole body and is shared by the whole community or communion. Community is from the Latin that means shared in common, right? So the book of common prayer, that which is of the community of faith. So why is the book of common prayer so important? Recall from an earlier lesson that the Anglican Church intends uh, no private teaching, uh, no confession or practice of her own. Rather, her doctrine and discipline and worship are that of the apostolic and undivided church. And the ancient creeds are her confession, together with the testimony of the Holy Scripture that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue in heaven and on earth and under the earth confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that's our confession. What we find in the Book of Common Prayer is what we are committed before God to do and to be as his servants. The prayer book is our means for putting the faith of the Bible into practical action and operation in our lives. So there's this Latin maxim that you've all heard before. Most of you have heard before. Do you know what I'm going to say? I like that one, but that's not it. It starts with lex. Lex, lex orandi, lex credendi, which means that the, the law or the rule of praying is the law or rule of believing. You understand that? So the way we pray, basically, is the way we believe. What we pray ultimately determines what we believe, which, going back to my emphasis on the music, which is why that's so important, because what we sing is part of what we're praying, isn't it? It's all part of our prayer. So it needs to be strong uh, doctrinally and reinforce our worship, just like the, the recessional hymn on the way out. Archdeacon Armstrong and I uh, were talking and, I, and, and talking about how that hymn reinforced the theology of the sermon, for example. So these things should all fit together and reinforce and strengthen us in heart and mind and soul. So ultimately determines what we believe, in other words, how we pray in much the same way that our hearts will ultimately go where we invest our treasure. You know that lesson, right? So I heard a bishop, not in this church, preach it the other way around once. Didn't really like the idea that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He said he liked where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Well, on any given day, I don't feel like anteing up, you know, 10% shouldn't say that as a bishop. <laughs> but that's what we do. That's what we're commanded, right? So we are obedient, and then our hearts follow that right behavior, that behavior that's, that's guided by how we've been formed in our thinking and in our convictions and our understanding of who God is and who we are, how desperately we need God because of sin. So it is our common prayer that forms us by shaping and rightly instructing and feeding our hearts and minds and our souls and bodies, which shapes and forms our righteous actions toward the upbuilding of the body of Christ and the extension of his kingdom through the manifestation of his love for the world through us, through the proclamation of his gospel in word and deed, the Greek word orthodoxy means what? Rightly, right praise. It means right praise. Think about that. Isn't that what we're talking about here? Right praise. Thus, orthodoxy is worship that embodies right belief about God and the worship of God according to his commandments. Okay, so rites and ceremonies 
I talked about liturgy. <clears throat> um, rites and ceremonies refer respectively to the words and the actions, okay? The words that we're reading, hearing, and the things that we're doing. So the rite of the sacrament of baptism would be all the words that are read by the officiant, the bishop or the priest, the sponsors, the person being baptized in the congregation, the things they're saying from the liturgy. The ceremony of the sacrament of baptism would include the sponsors coming forward with the person to be baptized, the pouring of water, the action of baptizing, the signing of the cross, and so forth. Okay, then rubrics. Everybody know what a rubric is? What is a rubric? That's a stage direction. What's that, Gail? Yeah, it's the italicized instructions. And why do they call them rubrics? What does it mean? What's rubric mean? Yeah, it means red. The word means red. So originally, when they printed the prayer book, the rubrics, they call them that because they were printed in red to make them stand out from the black print of the liturgy, okay? R rubrics, I thought you all knew that. Like this. I think that's why we wear these bands. Is to remind us, yeah, that there's some rubrics in our life. Yeah. And we better pay attention. Um, let's see. The conduct of our liturgical worship which includes words and actions that I just described, rites and ceremonies, is guided by italicized directions uh, referred to as such because they're read. Anglican clergy are trained in the fine points of how to properly conduct the various liturgies of the church's prayer book to include not only attending to the rubrics in the book, but also to include the historical and theological background that are associated with the various rites, their rubrics, and their actions. And so this is where you get into these different traditions of how you, uh, of ceremony, different ceremonial traditions. So in an Anglo-Catholic parish at the consecration, uh, you will see the priest elevate the chalice and genuflect and elevate and genuflect. That's different ceremonial tradition, if you will, within the Anglican Church. So those things will vary somewhat, and, and they're somewhat, uh, well, in a sense, they, have, they do have theological meaning and agendas attached to them. Um, so I, I won't say they're just adiaphora, which means extraneous, not necessary to salvation, which I guess it doesn't matter whether you elevate the chalice or not to one's salvation or what's happening in the Holy Eucharist, but they, they all carry meaning. And my point is that the clergy are trained to understand these things historically, theologically, and you know challenge us, challenge me anyway, he can invite you or not, uh, by asking us why we do certain things and what is it about that? What are, what are our theological convictions? So rubrics, and there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of contention about rubrics since Thomas Cranmer started this whole thing by revising the, the corrupted ancient worship of the church, liturgies of the church. Okay? Um, the litany is the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about. Litany means entreaty. It's a biblical form of prayer. See Psalm 136 uh, when you have time. It's a series of invocations and supplications with alternating congregational responses. So you all are familiar with, because we've done the litany here and other, there are several litanies uh, within the liturgies of our prayer book. There's the litany uh, that's uh, in other times was used monthly within the church. There's a litany for the dying that, you, that we do in association with funerals. Uh, when we do visitation of the sick, uh, for ordinations, there's a litany, and the Decalogue itself, which we do first Sunday of the month, is, is a litany of sorts. It follows that uh, uh, 
say the commandment, the congregation responds, okay? Uh, and it's done, so it's done in a way that's prayerful. That makes it a litany. Then uh, finally, uh, regular versus the occasional services of the church. The regular services of the church that constitute what we would call the fixed rule or orders of worship. So the regular worship would include the Holy Communion, or back up, morning and evening prayer, or the daily offices, then the Holy Communion, uh, the litany, uh, so those would be the, uh, the fixed uh, worship of the church, or the regular services. Um, yeah, I got in the wrong page again. And the other services uh, or liturgies would be defined as occasional, occasional services and used on special occasions to which they apply. And I gave you some examples of what? Burial, baptism, confirmation, holy matrimony. Mm -hmm. See, as good Anglicans, you all knew those. So I should just be doing question and answer and having you give the answers. And then finally, the church year. Um, the church year is constituted by, in the prayer book, the calendars, uh, the lectionary provided in the front of the 1928 prayer book. Um, the church year beginning when? When in Advent? First Sunday of Advent, right? <clears throat> uh, so that would be the fourth Sunday prior to the Feast of the Incarnation, otherwise known as Christmas. And then uh, ending, what's the last Sunday of the Christian year? Christ the King Sunday, which is a relatively new addition. Um, which is the final Sunday of the Trinity season, if we go by strictly by the 28 calendar or lectionary. If you're looking at the 79, it would be Pentecost, the last Sunday of the season of Pentecost. Okay? So it's known by both of those names. Um, all right. So I figured I had to give you some kind of something on the screen, right? <laughs> it's pretty, it was a pretty short set of slides, wasn't it? <laughs> There's no death by PowerPoint here. <laughs> and like I say, I got rear-ended, so it took away all my keynote time. Why do we pray this way? So let me quote from Galatians 2.20. <clears throat> it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So as I'm going to get a little preachy here for just a couple minutes. As Christians, those whose lives are in Christ, the worship of God is the new DNA of our being born again. By repentance and true faith, and by water and the Holy Spirit. Our whole new life in the Spirit of God is characterized by our prayer to God at every level of our lives, is the essence of our new life in Christ, our breathing out and our breathing in. That's, that's our prayer life in Him, once we're born into Him. Is the life in the blood that circulates through our veins and our hearts, Therefore, it's natural and of our new nature in Christ that the early Christians and the fathers of the church, acting under the influence of the Spirit of God and according to the revelation of God's nature, would order the worship of the people of God and that such worship would reflect not only the sense of discipline and duty that such order brings, but also the rhythms and cycles of the life of God's creation and of God's chosen people, 
whose rites and ceremonies of worship were transformed by use, for use, by the new community of God's people established by Christ. The will of God permeating the lives of worship of his people on earth, reflecting the life in Christ in this world as it is in heaven. Certainly Jesus himself followed the Jewish calendar. Think about it. He participated in the rites and ceremonies of the people of Israel, of circumcision, attending Passover with Joseph and Mary, attended the synagogue on the Sabbath, instituted Holy Communion at the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal, although there's some contention about that. And the very, element, the very events of Almighty God's plan of redemption following and fulfilling the key events of annual Jewish observance to include the Passover, the Sabbath day, and Pentecost. Our worship is incarnational in that we enjoin the gift of our new life in Christ, our obedience to his great commandments, and the mission of his church through the obedient and unselfish stewardship of our whole heart and mind, our bodies and souls, our strength and resources to love the Lord our God and our neighbors as ourselves. And all that begins and ends as we organize our life in Christ around the life of common prayer, which is God's pattern for worship as it's been handed on to us by generation after generation of Jesus' devout faithful. We pray to adore and worship God, to glorify his holy name, to thank him for his goodness and mercy, to ask forgiveness for our sins, to seek our own welfare and the welfare of others according to God's providence, and to join our imperfect human wills to the perfect loving will of God. So, <clears throat> fixed religious rules and prayers or forms, I can't give this lecture without saying this, are the pattern of the scriptures in the early church and they protect the faithful from the whims or partialities of certain pastors. That's an important point. All right, finally, shoot. How scriptural are the liturgies of the Book of Common Prayer? Well, the, the case in point that I like to use is Holy Communion, and I don't have time to get real particular in all these details, but uh, let me give you what I can in the next three minutes or so. So regarding the structure of the liturgy, it's helpful to understand that the, the communion liturgy can be divided in two primary parts. Uh, and there are different ways to refer to these. I'm going to use the term anti-communion, which doesn't mean against, I mean A-N-T-E, communion, which means before communion, and communion. Anti-communion is the Christian community's continuation of the synagogue service of lessons and prayers. It's a continuation of the, the worship structure of God's people, a pattern also followed in the daily offices, I might say. In the early church, catechumens, which were those who were being instructed in preparation to be baptized, initiated into the, to membership of the church, they were dismissed from the service after the anti-communion during the time of the offertory. Communion is Jesus' fulfillment of all the Old Testament worship, all sacrifice, table fellowship, and of the Passover feast itself. So regarding the various parts of the communion liturgy, and uh, these all have particular names. I noticed, Archdeacon Don, you printed those names for a while. Do you remember seeing those bold headings for each of the paragraphs as you go through the, the communion part of the service. So again, clergy, um, well, Cranmer it took an intentional theological you know, tack towards putting that all together. And so it's very systematic in terms of 
being ordered and doctrinally sound. And it, it, I mean, it's a catechism in and of itself to study the prayer of consecration and so forth. But the, the liturgy has all these names and parts, and, I, and uh, I don't mean to throw them all at you to make you think I'm smarter than you, but just to let you know that there's a way to partition all these to talk about them. Um, so if you count these up, uh, and if you count the scripture readings as just one item, there are 26 different parts to the service of communion, um, well, to the whole liturgy, really. And nine of those 26 are straight out of Holy Scripture to include the readings from Scripture, okay? The other 17 are derived from Scripture in obedience to the Scriptures. So the Collect for Purity, which is the beginning of the service, um, what we open with is taken, for example, from Luke, Romans, 1 John, and 1 Thessalonians, so derived from the scriptures. The summary of the law is right out of the scriptures. The next thing is the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, right out of the scriptures. The Lord be with you uh, is a, both an Old Testament and a New Testament salutation and response. Uh, the collect of the day is coordinated with the scripture readings, and I, I brought a book to flash at you real quick, The Collects of Thomas Cranmer. You can go read about some uh, historical background on each and every one of those where it helps you understand where he draws from. But again, it's theology. It's their prayers, but they're teaching us Holy Scripture. It's all focused on the Scriptures and praying out of Holy Scripture. Um, the, old te the lessons, the psalm, obviously. The sermons are grounded in Scripture readings. The Nicene Creed is the teaching of the church of, of Holy Scripture, what the Scriptures say about God's revelation of himself. The offertory sentences are quoted right out of Scripture. The prayers for the whole state of Christ's church are in response to 1 Timothy 2, uh, which says, first of all, then I urge that supplications prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men. Does that have a familiar ring? Confession of sin uh, out of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The absolution said by a bishop or priest in obedience to John 20. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The comfortable words are right out of Holy Scripture. The Sursum Corda, lift up your hearts. Uh, see the Psalms, numerous examples of thanksgivings. Uh, the prefaces. Uh, I mean, it's, you, you see where I'm going with this. I mean, it's all either straight out of Holy Scripture or it's in response to something directed from the Holy Scriptures. It, the Sanctus, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. God of power and might, right out of the, the scriptures. Uh, prayer of consecration, uh, the words of institution from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and then there's the oblation or offering, the invocation, the great amen. Does everyone know what that is? The great amen. That's the amen that you all say when the priest finishes the consecration prayer. Yeah, well, the great, so be it. Okay, so be it. Yeah, it means so be it. So the church's corporate affirmation of participation in all that was aforesaid, okay? So joining in. And so that should be a pretty enthusiastic amen. Um, and amen is a tradition. Uh, in the community of the people of God from, you'll find it from Deuteronomy to Revelation. Okay, that, that's right. That's why we say amen. It's shorter. It's a shorter. It could be. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me press on because I'm out of time. The Lord's Prayer, um, obviously, uh, and so on. So you get the idea. So our Anglican worship, uh, which is uh, our prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, 
you'll find that in every liturgy of the church is the early church fathers um, you know beginning with the apostles on derive their prayers from the ancient community and practices and scriptures holy scriptures of the church when those began to be corrupted as you read remember the preface thomas cranmer's you know given time anything written by man is eventually going to get corrupted essentially so it needed to be reformed and we need to continue to keep watch because we continually need to you know we tend to slip into wrong understandings and wrong teachings and wrong practices and so you you have a valiant defender of the faith in archdeacon donald armstrong who won't give an inch on any of this and is a terrific example of that um, it's so vital to the way we're formed in christ uh, that our, our prayer be right, that it be righteous, that it be the righteousness of God manifest through our prayers. Amen. I want to tell you that he turned next to me, turned to me and said, you know, that is really